Welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. We're uh, having an entire marathon of shows over the next several days, and we want to address some of the most important topics, uh, which is what we always try to do here, uh, addressing the central topics uh, dealing with Christianity and Islam. We have the two largest religions in history, and they make claims that contradict each other. And so we want to get to the bottom of this, which one is right, or is, either, is neither one right, or are you know, atheists right, something like that. Uh, well, if we want to address the, those kinds of issues, we have to look at the evidence, we have to look at arguments, and we have to see uh, where the facts point. Uh, tonight, we have, of course, Sam Shamoon with us, Triple B, big, bald, Beautiful. That's right. How are you don't doing? Forget, the camera has 50 pounds. I'm actually skinnier than before. Don't forget that. That's right. <laughs> he sure is. Uh, and we have uh, tonight as well uh, my friend Paul Rezcala. If you, Paul hasn't been on here. Well, you've been on ABN before when we were discussing. If, yeah. you, if you remember, Paul is uh, one of the people who was arrested in the city of Dearborn. Paul was uh, standing there, not saying anything to anyone, but he was part of uh, part of the group. Threw him in jail. Um, he spent the entire night crying. Uh, just kidding, by the way. He, uh, he, he, took, he, took, he took it like a man. He took Holding it like a man. David's hand. <laughs> he, he took it like a man. Um, but uh, we're going to look at a very important topic tonight. And this is something, if you talk to Muslims, if you try to share the gospel with Muslims, you're going to uh, be confronted with this issue over and over and over again, like a beating drum. And that's why we're going to address it. Uh, now, Paul. You have Muslim friends? Yes, sir. What do you believe as a Christian? Main tenets of the gospel. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could talk for an hour about what you want, right. what you believe Jesus, as a Christian. What would the what would the main idea be? Jesus uh, claimed to be divine and was divine. Okay. He was so crucified, deity of Christ. Right. Okay. Crucified and died for the sins of the world. Jesus died on a cross. Right. For sins. Okay. And he rose again on that third day. So his resurrection from the dead. And by the way, uh, you know, it, those of you who want to study Christianity, that's the core of the gospel. Jesus said all kinds of things. He taught all kinds of things. He preached sermons. Uh, but when we look to the core of the gospel, always, always, always we find death, deity, resurrection. Death, deity, resurrection. So you believe those things as a Christian. Is that what Muslims believe? Absolutely not. So Muslims don't believe Jesus died on the cross, don't believe he rose from the dead, don't believe he claimed to be divine. So we have a conflict here, right? And so as a Christian, uh, you're commanded to, to share the gospel, and Muslims don't believe that, and so there's going to be disagreement there. So when you tell a Muslim, hey, my Muslim friend, I've got my Bible here, my Bible says Jesus claimed to be divine, he died on the cross for sins, he rose from the dead, like clockwork, what's the response going to be? Your book is corrupted my friend Your, our book has been corrupted the Bible has been corrupted and and it makes sense why a Muslim would say that the Bible and the Quran disagree they agree on certain things don't get me wrong and, and it's very important to point out when Christians and Muslims do agree on things Christians and Muslims agree that Jesus uh, was born of a virgin we agree that Jesus performed miracles we agree that Jesus is the Messiah we agree that God exists that God created the world we believe we, we agree on all kinds of things so it's not like we we disagree on everything uh, but when we get down to the core of the gospel the core of the the message that Christians want to share with others we find Islam teaches the exact opposite on these things and so uh, if you're a Muslim if you're a Muslim you believe that the gospel was originally inspired an inspired message you have to believe that because this isn't you know if, if I talk to an atheist or something like that and I, I tell him about Jesus the atheist can say I don't care about Jesus I don't, I don't believe in him but Muslims aren't allowed to say that so Muslims have certain things that their religion requires them to believe and one of the things they have to believe in they have to believe Jesus was a messenger of God so Sam yes sir Muslims will say the gospel's been corrupted yeah. right we you know this we've we've heard this what thousands of times yeah now is that the impression you would get from the Quran? Would a Muslim ever get this impression from the Quran? If a Muslim opens up his Quran, reads it from yeah. beginning to end, is he going to walk away from that thinking, wow, the book that those Christians have, that is one messed up weird book? I just wanted to make one comment. When you said that, uh, what would the Muslims say about our Gospels? You said, they said it was corrupt, huh? You said it with such passion and you know, conviction, you convinced me. No. Uh, <clears throat> as a side note, uh, if someone were to read the Quran, and try to be as objective in the reading of the Quran, which is hard because every one of us 
uh, approach a text with presuppositions. But if someone were just allow the Quran to speak within its own context, the last thing that they would conclude is that the author of the Quran or the authors of the Quran <clears throat> assumed that the biblical revelation was tampered with because you find a plethora of passages confirming the veracity, the authenticity, and the authority of the scriptures in the possession of the Jews and Christians. Now, for the sake of time, and by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just take a look at a few of them. And by the way, <clears throat> I know that you've written a tract on this mm -hmm. that's available on your blog, AnsweringMuslims.com. AnsweringMuslims.com, David Wood wrote an excellent tract that can actually be downloaded, correct? Yeah, it can be printed, it can print it out. Yes, and use it in their evangelism, their witness to Muslims. So these passages are found in the tract, but let's just, just look at some of them. For example, chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 3 and 4. Specifically, verse 3, it says this. Now, I'm going to also uh, comment on the Arabic, because unfortunately, many of the translators obscure what the Arabic says, uh, because if you actually look at the Arabic, it's even more powerful. It's a more powerful witness to the veracity of the Scriptures. And in order to understand my point let me first read the passage chapter 3 verse 3 says <clears throat> he has sent down upon you he is supposedly Allah who is supposed to be the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he has sent down upon you Muhammad the book with truth confirming what was before it now that's how this particular translation renders the Arabic confirming what was before it actually anyone who speaks Arabic can confirm the following Paul speaks Arabic yes you should. Do you, by the way? I don't know. I didn't want to put you on the spot. He yes. put you on the spot. All right. The Arabic phrase is actually musaddiqan lima baina yadehi. Little translation confirming that which is between his hands. Right. Now, that's an Arabic idiom referring to the scriptures that Muhammad had access to. So, whatever scriptures Muhammad had access to in the seventh century, he is testifying and confirming their veracity, saying that these scriptures are the words of God and should be trusted and believed in. So, so. <clears throat> If, the, if, we, if we go with what your average Muslim will tell us on the street, it would be something like, Jesus got a message, Jesus delivered a message to his followers, but someone like the Apostle Paul came along, corrupted the message, and then, or they'll say, you know, the Council of Nicaea. But would any of that make sense if Muhammad is saying that you guys have it between your hands? Yeah, well, right? it, it put it this way. Since we don't believe Muhammad is a prophet, it is, in theory, possible the scriptures are corrupt. Right. But, but that would but, only but prove that he's not, a false prophet. They shouldn't believe that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. If the scriptures historically can be proven to have been corrupted, then this is even further proof that Muhammad is a false prophet because he thought otherwise. In other words, if you're a Muslim, you must adopt Muhammad's position concerning the scriptures. His position is the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are the uncorrupt revelations of God. Now, if history testifies that they've been corrupted, that's even more proof he's a false prophet. However, if he's correct, and Muslims have to believe he's correct, he still turns out to be a false prophet because in bearing witness to the veracity of the Bible, which is the only scriptures the Jews and Christians had at that time, the Bible ends up contradicting the message of the Quran concerning the nature of God, the person of Christ, and his work. So either way, Muhammad turns out to be a false prophet. But, uh, but you're not basing that all on one little passage oh, no, Surah 3, right? Oh, there's plenty of passages. In fact, let me just finish this passage to see what scripture Muhammad had in mind because it goes on to say and he the same uh, divine uh, source that sent down the Quran sent down it says in the same verse chapter 3 verse 3 the Torah and the gospel so if anyone was uh, confused about what scriptures Muhammad had in mind here it says the scriptures that Muhammad had in mind are the Torah which is actually the Hebrew word for the law given to Moses if you ask any uh, uh, Jewish authority on the Old Testament, what is the law of Moses? And in Hebrew, it's Torah, meaning instructions. The Torah of Moses and the gospel. What gospel? The gospel given to Jesus. So these are the scriptures that Muhammad confirms to be the uncorrupt words of God. Now, for the sake of time, let me look at a few others. There are plenty more passages that we can delve into, but again, for the sake of time, in order not to take most of the time just talking about these passages, I'll give you a few more. Chapter 6, verse 115 says this. Chapter 6, verse 115 and it's actually reiterated in chapter 18, verse 27 of the Quran. Let me give the verses again. Chapter 6, verse 115, and chapter 18, verse 27, says the following. Perfect are the words of your Lord in truthfulness and justice. Perfect are the words of your Lord. <clears throat> no man can change his words. He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Ask the Muslim that you're witnessing to, was the Torah the word of Allah? Say yes. Was the gospel the word of Allah? Yes. Is the Quran the word of Allah? Yes. Well, according to this passage, 
No one can change the words, plural, of Allah. Cannot be changed. So just a matter of logic. If the words of Allah can't be changed, and the Torah and the Gospel, as well as the Psalms, the Quran mentions the Psalms given to David, they are the words of Allah, then the conclusion is that the Torah and the Gospel and the Psalms cannot be corrupted, have not been changed. If they've been changed, and that means the Quran is mistaken, because it says no one can change the words of Allah, but you're telling me his words have been changed, because the Torah, the Gospel, and the Psalms, which were the words of Allah, have been corrupted. So Muslims are saying... Allah's word has been changed and corrupted. We open up the Quran and it says no one can change Allah's Precisely. word. So Muslims are contradicting their own book. In fact, and just to solidify what you just said and what I said earlier, Muslim scholars themselves appeal to chapter 6 verse 115 and 1827 to prove the incorruptibility of the Quran. Their logic goes like this. The Quran is the word of Allah. None can change the words of Allah. Therefore, the Quran can never be changed. But then I tell Muslims, be consistent. In fact, some Muslims historically were consistent and applied it to the other scriptures. Right? For example, some Muslims applied the words of chapter 6, verse 115 to the Torah to prove that the Torah given to Moses has never been corrupted because this passage says none of the words can be changed and the Torah is the words of Allah, therefore it could never have been changed. So they saw that. But now here's the dilemma again. Now again, I don't want to bring up the quote-unquote Islamic dilemma, but here's the dilemma for the Muslims. If the Quran is right, no, no one can change the words of Allah. And that includes the Torah, the Gospel and the Psalms. Then that means what I have in my possession, the Holy Bible, must be the uncorrupt revelations of God. If that's the case, then the Quran is false because the Quran contradicts the testimony of the scriptures in my possession. So either way, it's a lose-lose situation for the Muslims. Win-win situation for us. And glory to Jesus Christ. He's made it so easy to present the truth of the gospel to the Muslims. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is study the material and present it for the glory of Jesus, prayerfully and in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, now, Sam, I'm going to have to challenge you on an issue. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. The Quran says no one can corrupt Allah's word. No one can change Allah's word, right? Yes. No one can change Allah's words. But we open up the... Gospel, because according to the Quran, the gospel is the word of God, and no one can corrupt Allah's word. Therefore, the gospel is authoritative and preserved, and so on. Yeah. We open up, we open up the gospel, and we read what Jesus was telling his followers. Now, he said things like this over and over again. I'll read you one passage. This is from Mark chapter 9. Uh, I'll begin at verse 30. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man, this is a title Jesus used of himself, Amen. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. They will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise from the dead. Jesus says these things over and over, and ultimately, we have it in the gospel. Jesus is crucified. He's, he's scourged. He's nailed to a cross. He's given a death blow. He is put in a tomb. Jesus is dead. Yes. We open up the Quran. We open up the Quran. Is this what the Quran teaches? Well, most Muslims would base their beliefs on Surah 4, 157 to 158. I'll read it for you. They, that they said in boast, this is, uh, this is referring to Jews. Now, this is a side note, but think about how ridiculous this passage is. <laughs> According to this passage, yeah. Jews were boasting about killing the Messiah. Right? Now, there only t now, there are Jews who believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They would never boast about killing him. Exactly. And on the other hand, there are Jews who might, uh, you know, at that time, boast about killing Jesus, but they didn't believe he's the Messiah. So here you have in the Quran Jews boasting about killing the Messiah. It's just really, really uh, silly passage, but that's a different issue. They said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. They killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power wise. So according to this passage, they didn't kill Jesus. It was made to appear to them that way. And the, the 
the, the most common Muslim interpretation is that someone like Judas was crucified in his place. So God took Judas, disguised him, made him look like Jesus. Then Judas was put on the cross. He was crucified. He died, but Jesus was safe. Jesus didn't die. And if he didn't die, obviously he didn't die for anyone's <clears throat> exactly. sins. So we open up the gospel. Jesus says he's going to die, and then later on it shows that he died. We open up the Quran. Jesus didn't die. He wasn't crucified. Didn't happen. It was someone else. So the gospel tells us one thing. The Quran tells us something else. But the Quran tells us that the gospel cannot be changed or corrupted. I, that's the issue I want to challenge because I say there is one. There is one yeah. who can change Allah's word. And we even have indications of this with the, uh, with the, with the doctrine of abrogation, wouldn't yeah, we? Yeah, yes, exactly. So we, we open up the passages on abrogation in the Quran. Yeah, so yeah. Surah 2, 106, uh, Surah 16, 101, we find the justification for saying Allah can exchange one revelation for another is that Allah has power over all things. Precisely. Allah has power over all things. So we have a little mystery on our hands. You might yep. already be able to figure out the answer. There is one, I would say, who can corrupt Allah's word. The passages we read in the Quran about no one being able to corrupt his words or yeah. change his words. It, it's like Allah is pointing to everyone saying, you guys can't corrupt you my can't words. It, you're, yeah. you're not powerful enough. You're not mm -hmm. powerful enough. Allah is too powerful. And by, by the way, when I read those passages in the Quran, that's good theology. That's, that's good theology, 100 right? 100% good theology. That's good theology. That's good theology. When, 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 when the Quran is saying, that's Allah. If he wants something done, if he wants a message to get across, you can't stop him. You can't stop God. I, I read that. That's, that's great theology. That's what we believe as Christians. You can't, you're not going to be able to stop God from getting a message across. And I mean, I mean think, about, think about why that's good theology. I mean, imagine I told you, oh, there, there's, you know, I believe in God. And, you know, he, he really wanted to bring this to people. He really wanted to get this message across to people. And, and, and he tried really hard to get it across to people. But, you know, the apostle Paul came along and he just snatched it away and God couldn't stop him. And, uh, you know, poor God. Poor Allah, he just couldn't protect it from the Apostle Paul. He just couldn't protect it from Constantine. Those, those Romans are tough. Those Romans are really Boy, tough are they people. Tough. Yeah. They are so tough. They're, they're more powerful than Allah. They, they corrupted his word. Poor Allah. So such a sad story. That, you understand why that's bad theology, right? When you tell me something about God wanting to do something and then God not being able to do it, you're telling me something about the God you believe in. You're telling me he is weak. He's impotent. He can't accomplish what he wants to accomplish. That's just a sad story. So when we open up the Quran and we read passages about Allah being so powerful, no one can stop him. No one can corrupt his word. No one can get in his way. No one can do it. That's good theology. We read that and say, amen. And then Muslims come along and kind of ruin it by saying, oh, but, you know, Apostle Paul, he's so tough. He stopped God. And uh, Constantine, all oh, these really tough dudes. Uh, so Muslims are coming along and kind of ruining this, this, this theology. But we have a mystery on our hands. Yeah. We have a mystery on our hands. The Quran teaches Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. And the Quran affirms no one can corrupt the gospel. And the gospel says Jesus died by crucifixion. So is there someone who can corrupt Allah's word, who can change the message, who can change the gospel? And I think there is someone who could do it. I think there is someone. I'm not talking about man. I'm not talking about Satan. There is someone who yeah. can corrupt Allah's word, right? Yep. Uh, in fact, you uh, uh, opened up a very good topic. In fact, Lord willing, we should do an entire session on abrogation because the implication of the verses, and by the way, just to give you an idea of what uh, Dave was talking about, abrogation, he mentioned chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran, and he mentioned chapter 16, verse 101, and I'll include another one, chapter 13, verse 39 that Allah has the power to abolish, <clears throat> to abrogate, to cancel out verses that were sent down. So to answer the question, there is one who can corrupt and change his words, and that's Allah. The Quran implies that Allah has the power to corrupt the very words that were revealed to his messengers and prophets. So when it says no one can change the words of Allah, that means no one other than Allah. That's the implication. But let me uh, throw a little monkey wrench into the equation. And I've actually written an article on this, and this is why it's rather interesting you bring it up. You just said a moment ago, no human being, not even Satan, can change the words of Allah. So the implication is that Allah alone and only Allah can corrupt and change his words. However, are you aware, uh, <clears throat> Dave, that if you read chapter 2, verse 106 carefully, 
if you read it, it says nothing of our revelation. Well, now here it says nothing of our revelation. Now that obscures what the Arabic actually says. It doesn't say nothing of our revelation. It says <clears throat> whatever revelation or verse actually, whatever verse we cause, uh, we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. The actual Arabic says whatever verse we cause to be abrogated or forgotten. That's what the actual text says. Now, why is that important? If the Arabic actually says that Allah abrogates a verse but doesn't specify where this verse comes from, you can actually make a case on the basis of the satanic verses that the verses that Allah abrogates are the ones that Satan reveals, especially through the agency of, of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Now, this introduces the topic of the satanic verses. And again, I don't want to go off topic, but real briefly, David has done an entire presentation on it, and Lord willing, we may do another presentation on it, and he's done a full debate on it. According to the earliest references and historical works on the life of Muhammad, Muhammad recited verses that he thought were from Allah, praising the daughters of Allah. Banat Allah, Alat al uzamanat Now you can find traces of that in chapter 53 of the Quran, verses 19 to 23. Although in the present form, it's a denial that these goddesses exist. Historically, according to the earliest sources in the life of Muhammad, Muhammad at one time said that these three daughters of Allah, Alat al uzza Manat, were high-flying cranes whose intercession was accepted by Allah. He praised them and praised their intercession. Later on, Muhammad said those verses were inspired uh, by Satan. Satan cast those verses upon my tongue. And then Allah sent Gabriel to abrogate those verses. In fact, it's chapter 22, verse 52. Let me read that. Chapter 22, verse 52. Never sent we a messenger or a prophet before you, but when he recited what Satan proposed, what did the messengers supposedly recite? What Satan proposed, what Satan revealed, in respect of that which he recited thereof, but Allah abolishes what Satan proposes. You can actually make a strong case, Dave, that Allah is actually abrogating not verses that he sent down, but that Satan revealed. So now we have a dilemma. If we take the traditional interpretation of chapter 2, verse 106, Allah has the power to corrupt his verses. He sends down verses that he corrupts, abrogates, cancels out. Or if you actually take the more literal reading of 2106, it says, it doesn't say none of our revelations. It says none of the revelations do we abrogate or cancel out, but we replace with something similar or better. None of the revelations, that leaves it general. It leaves it unspecified. In light of 2252, you, you can use that to show that what Allah is actually abrogating are the verses inspired by Satan. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Oh, and we're just getting started. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. And we're going to discover who, according to Islam, corrupted the gospel. The answer may disturb you if you're a Muslim. See you in a moment. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We're addressing a, a very simple question. It should be simple for, for Muslims if, if, if this were really a simple issue, which, which it isn't. Who corrupted the gospel? Muslims tell us the gospel has been corrupted. They say that whenever we bring up various passages from the Bible that disagree with what the Quran says. Well, if the Bible and the Quran uh, disagree, they contradict one another, obviously the Bible, the gospel must have been corrupted. And the question that arises immediately after that should be, who corrupted it? You're telling me someone corrupted it. I want to know who. Give me an idea of what you mean. Was it the Apostle Paul? Was it, uh, you know, someone at the at a Council of Nicaea? And just for the record, anyone who tells you the Council of Nicaea had something to do with the the, the texts Christian believe in uh, has absolutely no clue. But you can use that as kind of a thermometer to, to test, a litmus test to see who you're talking to. When Because it's so common. When someone says Council of Nicaea and then tells you about the canon that Christians believe in, you have just met someone who has absolutely no clue what he's talking about. Uh, but Muslims want to say the gospel has been corrupted. We, we have every right to ask who. Could you, could you tell me who? And the thing is, once we go to the Quran and the Bible and we start investigating this, we get a very disturbing answer. You don't come up with the Apostle Paul corrupted the gospel. You don't come up with um, with the Council of Nicaea, the Gospels corrupted at it. 
You don't come up with that. You get a very, very different, very disturbing answer. We're going to take you through it step by step, then we're going to go to some callers. Uh, let's kind of zoom through this. We already addressed some of these points. We want to uh, briefly cover some of them again, just so you're clear what the case is that, that we're laying out. Now, uh, Paul, I mentioned earlier that, you know, if I'm talking to an atheist, lots of atheists would say that they like Jesus. Uh, when, when I was an atheist, I, I thought, you know, I thought Jesus was, you know, was pretty cool and he, he taught some cool things. Uh, but if I lay down Jesus as an authority to an atheist, the atheist could say, I don't, I don't care what he says. I don't believe, I don't believe in him. I, I don't believe he existed. I don't, you know, or if he did exist, you know, I don't, I don't believe uh, that I have to follow what he says. I don't believe he was actually sent from God because I don't believe in God. An atheist could say something like that. Is a Muslim free to say that? Can a Muslim say, I don't care what Jesus said? Absolutely not. Well, why not? You have in the Quran, the Quran confirms that Jesus was actually preaching the message of Islam during his ministry. Uh, Surah 19, 23 to 33 actually talks about how Jesus' ministry even began from when he was an infant. He was preaching Islam. He was preaching uh, the message of Allah throughout his life. What do you mean infant, Paul? What in the world are you talking about? He was Jesus preaching Islam as an infant? <laughs> what? Right. That sounds what are you weird. About? That's good You're Islamic up, theology. Right? You're making this up. Pull it up and read it. You mean in the Quran, <laughs> chapter 19, it says that Jesus, from infancy, right after his mother gave birth to him, he started espousing Islamic theology? Right. Now, that would have been a sight for sore eyes, right? To see an infant <laughs> saying, you know, I am a servant of Allah, I am his prophet. Is that what you're saying the Quran says? Exactly. Give the reference again, because people say, no, you're lying. You know, you, your hatred for Islam is so evident. You're again, making it up. The reference is Surah 19, 23 to 33. Wow. Those are the verses. So it's in there. It says so you can check right. that out. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. If you try to picture it in your head, like, you know, how a baby sounds, how a baby, you know, <laughs> you know, they, you know they goo goo yeah. gaga and stuff. But this, you know, this is baby Jesus, and he's actually... <laughs> giving Islamic theology. He's giving a little, little mini-sermon, yeah. um, and, and and according yeah. to the Quran. Yeah, yeah, well, all right. Okay, Paul, yeah. you're saying, though, so a Muslim, you're saying, stuff. cannot object to the teachings of Christ. Okay, go ahead. Ken. Another reference for that, actually, is 42.13, Surah 42.13, which shows that Jesus' message was actually no different from any other prophet that was before him, um, or even Muhammad, for that matter. All right. Now, now, now. That, but another objection that could arise. And by the way, you find that throughout the throughout the Quran, constantly affirming the message of Jesus. But suppose, and I and I, I've seen Muslims bring this up. Look, sometimes read the Old Testament, right? Read the Old Testament. Sometimes the prophets are preaching and preaching and preaching their hearts out, and people just don't care. They just don't listen, right? That happens, right? Yeah. So, so, so the prophets go out, they preach, and everyone just rejects them, or or treats them horribly, or kills them, things like that. So could a Muslim then say, because the Muslim wants to say that the gospel has been corrupted or changed, could the Muslim say, well, yeah, Jesus, I do believe that Jesus spoke the truth, but he preached his heart out and people just didn't care. They didn't pay attention. And so there was no one to carry on this message. Could a, could a Muslim say that? Again, no, because the Quran in uh, verse 352 and 5111 shows that Jesus' uh, teachings were accepted by a number of followers, and those followers actually adhered to the basic tenets of Islam. So you had Muslims actually in the first century that were converting to Islam because of Jesus' message, and they adhered yeah. to Islamic so theology. In other words, Jesus was successful, not unsuccessful. Right, right. But now that's what you're confusing me. You keep saying the Quran says he's Muslim and his followers are Muslims. But when I read the Gospels, it's anything but Islam. Isn't right. that proof the Gospels are corrupted? Corrupted, got to be. Bam. Yeah, but the point is, wait, see, see, we're late. That's where I'm confused. We're, yeah, we're late. Yeah. Oh, you're you're about to get more confused, <laughs> buddy. You're about to get really, really confused. Right. So think about what the Quran is saying here, because we you, we we don't we don't want there. There's no easy way out of this. There are little things a Muslim can say. Oh, you know, uh, you know, maybe he didn't, maybe he wasn't successful or something like that. These are these sorts of objections or responses are blocked by what Muslims are required to believe in the Quran. One, Muslims have to believe in Jesus as a messenger of God, and two, they have to believe, because of what the Quran says, that Jesus was at least somewhat successful in that he won followers, he passed on his message to followers. So, in other words, we're looking at this, we're saying, where has it been corrupted? You can't say 
it was corrupted from the beginning and it was just a false message because Jesus spoke the truth according to Islam. So, well, when did it get corrupted then? Well, you can't say Jesus never passed it on to his followers and so that it was corrupted, you know, as soon as it left his mouth, it just fell, you know, it was dead, right? That the message was dead. He actually passed it on to his followers. So the question is, well, okay, you have Jesus. He delivered the message to his followers. So the message was reliable when it was delivered to his followers. And then his followers had the message. When did it get corrupted? Can a Muslim then say, these followers didn't last. They didn't make it, right? He, 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 he preached the message. People converted to this early first century Islam. They had the message. They had the gospel. But then these followers were overpowered by other people like the Apostle Paul who came along and corrupted the message and changed it. And the true followers of Jesus, they just didn't last. Can a Muslim say that? A Muslim cannot say that because, check this out. <laughs> he said, check this out. Go ahead. The followers of Jesus, Allah promised that they would be the ones that would be superior or prevalent until the last day. Now, I'm going to read this uh, passage from the Quran. Yeah, we so want to make sure you're not making this stuff. Yeah, Surah you know, 3. You are a Christian. You're, you're a liar. You know I'm that, right? totally biased. Yeah. Surah 3. Missionary. Right. Go ahead. Right. Surah 3, verse 55. You can check this. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme, I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject the faith to the day of resurrection. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who? Who's he going to make superior? Those who follow thee. So Jesus followed. Jesus won right. followers. Allah is making a promise to Jesus. I'm going to make your followers superior to those who reject it. For how long? For yeah, like a year? One, yeah. For two years? Yeah. Forever until the day of resurrection. Until the, has wow. the day of resurrection happened yet? Mm. No. So this is still ongoing, right? Allah, and keep in mind, if, if a Muslim tells me, just, just, and we still have more to cover. We still have a lot more to cover. But even if a Muslim wants to say, if a Muslim just wants to say the gospel has been corrupted, we already have that Allah is a liar, according to you. If you, as a Muslim, tell me that the gospel has been corrupted, of course we can point to all kinds of passages in the Quran where Allah says no one can corrupt his word and that the gospel is the word and that Christians during Muhammad's time still had the word, it hadn't been corrupted. We can point to all those passages and say, okay, Allah was wrong, he was wrong, he was wrong, he was wrong, he was wrong. Not according to us, according to you. According to Muslims, Allah was wrong. But here we have Allah talking to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I'm going to protect your followers until the day of resurrection. That's a long time. And if you tell me Allah didn't do that, then you're telling me Allah made a promise to Jesus that he just didn't keep. This is why we said that if you start telling us about the gospel being corrupted and Allah's word being corrupted, you're, you're not just telling us about something that happened historically. You're telling us something about the God you believe in. And right now, if you say the gospel has been corrupted, you're telling us Allah made a promise to Jesus that he just couldn't keep. If Allah made a promise to his prophet, to his messenger, and he couldn't even keep that, why do you believe anything Allah says he's going to do? He just can't do it. He just can't do it. He, he's, he's totally incompetent. That's what you're telling me about your God when you say the gospel has been corrupted. So already, my friends, we're going to go to some callers. We have more to discuss. Let's take a couple of callers because we don't, want to, we don't want it to build up until there are 50 on the line. We have several on the line. We want to deal with those. But we're going to get back to this. But already, Muslims are required to believe in Jesus. They are required to believe that Jesus passed the message on to his followers. And they are required to believe that Allah proclaimed, told Jesus that those followers would be victorious until the day of resurrection. And guess what? If their message was corrupted and they were, they were overthrown by the Apostle Paul, this didn't happen. Allah failed. He couldn't keep his promise. Allah promises Jesus, I'm going to protect your followers. I'm going to protect the followers. And you tell me these followers failed. That's some weird stuff you Muslims believe in. Very, very weird stuff. All right, let's go to some callers. Uh, we'll try to take a few. We hope the questions are related to the topic. Take a couple of callers very quickly, and then we'll get back to our topic. Who do we have on the line? Hello? Hello. Uh, am I on the line? Yes, brother. you are. Yes, brother, you oh, are. Yes, uh, I'm Yuki. I'm calling from the UK. Hey, how's it going? How are you, buddy? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, first of all, uh, big fans here of uh, Brother Sham, Sam, and uh, Brother David, of course. I'm originally from Indonesia. I'm a Catholic. Uh, a few questions, uh, brother. The, uh, One at a time. Questions. Yeah. Just make uh, the one at a time question. so we can follow. Go ahead. 
All right. My my first question is, um, uh, can you give me the the Quranic reference um, where it says uh, that the Bible will not be corrupt by the end of time? Oh, we can give you a bunch of those. Oh, yeah. Sam, give them a give them a yeah. quick listen. By the way, everyone right now, you'll want to know these verses because uh, they are so important. Yeah. Get out. This is the time where you get out your pen, write down yeah. all of these references. And make sure you have these references on hand. Yeah, and by the way, let me just, uh, it's not only important that you read the references, I highly encourage you, my brother in the Lord Jesus Christ, go to our website, answering-islam.org, answering-islam.org. Please go there. When you go to the main page, you're going to see a section that says the Quran. When you go to the main page, to your left, there's a section that says the Quran. Click on it. There you're going to see a section that says what the Quran says about the Bible. You're going to see a plethora of articles that give full expositions of these passages. So it's not just important reading the passages, but understanding them in context. Now with that said, I'm going to give you references where it says, the words of God, which refers to the scriptures, <clears throat> can never be corrupted. Let me give you two references that testify to that fact. One which I read earlier, chapter 6, verse 115. So write this down. Chapter 6, verse 115. It says, none can change the words of your Lord. Now, even Muslim expositors, and this is why you need to go to the website to read the commentaries that we provide by Muslims, who admit that this refers to the scriptures because the scriptures are the words of Allah, the words of God. So chapter 6, verse 115, chapter 18, verse 27, those two verses, write those down. They talk about the incorruptibility of the words of Allah. And according to the Quran, the Torah the Law of Moses, the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Psalms of David. The Quran makes reference to the Zabur, the Psalms of David. Let me give you the references to that. In chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 163, chapter 4, verse 163, and chapter 17, verse 55. Chapter 17, verse 55, it says, Allah gave the Psalms to David. And even quotes from Psalm 37, Verse 29, it even quotes directly from Psalm 37, verse 29, in chapter 21 of the Quran, verse 105. Chapter 21, verse 105, actually is a direct quotation from Psalm 37, verse 29. So the Quran acknowledges that these are scriptures of Allah, these are His words, therefore they can never be corrupted. Now some other passages I want you to look at, but make sure to go to the website to read the full exposition of the meaning of these passages. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 3 and 4. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 3 and 4. That's one. <clears throat> Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 48 to 50. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 48 to 50. That's another. Chapter 3, verse 48 to 50. Chapter 5 of the Quran, <clears throat> verses 43 all the way to 48. Chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 43 all the way to 48. And that would probably be the, that the is best the, passage. That's, right? that's the, the most powerful. And yeah. let me mention two more. Chapter 10, verse 94, which I did not read. Chapter 10, verse 94, where it says, if you, and it's singular, by the way. That's Muhammad. Arabic. That's when it says, when it's singular, it's talking to Muhammad yes. there. Yes. And there it says, if you, Muhammad, are in doubt concerning the revelations which we sent down to you, ask those who've been reading the book before you. Surely the truth has come to you from your Lord, so do not be of the doubters. Two things to note from that passage, chapter 10, verse 94. Number one, the Quran acknowledges that Muhammad was doubting whether these revelations came from God. Mm -hmm. So the Quran acknowledges that Muhammad himself was questioning, are these really revelations from God? Number two, it tells Muhammad, if you want to assure yourself that these revelations are from God, go to the people who have been reading the book before you. There is no Muslim in this world who will deny that's a reference to Jews and Christians. Why do I say that? All throughout the Quran, Jews and Christians are called Ahl al-Kitab. Ahl al-Kitab, meaning the people of the book. Why are they called that? Because the Quran recognizes long before Muhammad, Allah, supposedly the God of the Quran, sent down revelation to the Jews and Christians. So this is why they're called the people of the book. So now my brother, notice this. If you're doubting whether the Quran is from God, you're commanded to go to the Jews and Christians to consult their book, to determine whether this book is from God or not. Irony of ironies. Yeah. The reason why I say irony of ironies, my brother, is because if you as a Muslim, and you're not, I'm speaking to the Muslim, come to me and say, hey, is this Quran from God? Can you confirm it for me? The last thing in the world I'll tell you is that the Quran is from God. 
because the Quran contradicts the book that the Quran confirms to be true, meaning the Bible, thereby proving that Muhammad is a false prophet and the Quran is a false message. Now let me read the final one and we'll go to your other question. This one is a powerful one. Uh, my brother, are you aware that the Quran says that those who deny the message given to the apostles of God, they will be fed it fluid for the fire? Chapter 40, verses 70 to 72. Chapter 40, verses 70 to 72. Those who cry lies to the book, and that wherewith we sent our messengers. Now notice, it's attacking people who say the Quran is a lie, and the message given to the messengers before Muhammad, soon they will know when the fetters and chains are on their necks, and they are dragged into the boiling water. Now Yusuf Ali translates it as fetid fluid. Then into the fire they are poured. Did you catch that? If you dare say my Bible is a lie, it's corrupted, the Quran says a painful torment awaits you. Now does that sound like a man who believed the Bible's corrupt? Mm -mm. That was chapter 40, verses 70 to 72. And that was his first question. Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, just think about this. So, so you have several passages there. Those are all those are all the key passages. But just think about the the, the irony here. Uh, we didn't. Uh, Sam mentioned the passage, Surah sort of five, forty three to forty eight. Uh, verse forty seven of that passage commands Christians to judge by the gospel. It says, "People of the gospel, we have to judge by what Allah has revealed therein. If we judge." by what we read in the gospel. First of all, we can't do that if the gospel has been corrupted. If the gospel has been changed. It's no longer reliable. It was corrupted by the Apostle Paul or at the Council of Nicaea. Can we judge by the gospel? No, we don't have it. We don't have it anymore. Or, it's been, or if we do have it, it's weird and full of corruption and false teaching. So we can't judge by it. So when the Quran commands us to judge by what we read in the gospel, we have to go with, with the gospel we have, which according to the Quran cannot be corrupted anyway. So we have to judge by the gospel as Christians according to the Quran. And if we don't, if we refuse, if we say, I'm not going to judge by the gospel, the Quran calls us rebels. We're no better than those who rebel if we refuse to judge by the gospel. So think about this. Christians, according to the Quran, are commanded to judge by what we read in the gospel. If we judge Islam by what we read in the gospel, we have to reject Islam. We have to reject Muhammad. But not only are we commanded to judge by the gospel, Muslims themselves, <laughs> starting with Muhammad, are supposed to come to us and confirm, hey, if you have any doubts, if you have any doubts, check with the people who read the gospel and the Torah. Yeah. And we're going to tell you, hey, we already judged. We already judged that Islam is false. So, so you know, kind of a, a broad picture here. This goes back to, to, to what Sam calls the Islamic dilemma. Yeah. If <laughs> the gospel has been corrupted, then Muhammad's a false prophet because he commanded, us, he commanded us to judge by the gospel and he was commanded to come and listen to us, to what we say about the gospel and to judge his religion by what we read in the gospel. So if the gospel has been corrupted, Muhammad's a false prophet because his religion tells you to believe in the gospel. If, on the other hand, the gospel is reliable and no one, and, and no one can corrupt it, no one's ever corrupted it, then Muhammad's still a false prophet because he contradicts it. His teachings contradict the core claims. So, if the gospel is reliable, Muhammad's a false prophet. If the gospel is reliable, Muhammad's a false prophet. Either way, Muhammad's a false prophet. Let's talk about the gospel because, because Islam's just done. Islam self-destructs by affirming a message that it contradicts. All right, brother, we have other callers to go to, but you said you had multiple yeah. questions. We'll try, to take, yeah. we'll try and take one more if we can. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. By the way, did you understand our answer, brother? Oh, yes, 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 uh, perfectly. I've been uh, reading your articles as well. But uh, my other question is uh, relating to uh, Brother David's claim. Like, um, Brother David likes to say that, that uh, I think, like, if you look at, I mean, it's a bit off the topic, I'm sorry, but, uh, like, uh, violence according to the Quran is, uh, is prescriptive, while violence in the Bible is more like a descriptive thing. Mm -hmm. However, Muslims like to uh, refute by saying, but look at the book of Deuteronomy, for example. You know, down there, like, Christians are uh, commanded to kill mercilessly. And, and also, oh, uh, I think, like, Luke 14:23. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take the answer yes, uh, well, of yeah. the Make line. Make sure you uh, hear the I, answer. Yeah. Make sure you hear the answer. And, uh, yeah. you know, we're going to have to I do hope, a full I hope, topic. I, I hope, I hope you, you guys can uh, help me answer that just briefly. Uh, yes. Help me uh, okay. re refute th those claims briefly. Sure. I'll yeah, take the answer sure. of the line. I'll start, okay. I'll start off with the Quran, then you want to address yeah, the, the Deuteronomy but, yeah, passage. Repeat this question okay. so people understand. So, so, the, so the question is, so, so by, by the way, everyone, you know, just to, to give the general idea, because this is so common, uh, 
people in the West in general, we look at the Quran and we say, look, this is filled with violent passages. Right? So if our objection is there's violence in the Quran, well, guess what? We're being inconsistent, right? Because there's violence in the Bible. So we have to say, well, what's the difference? Well, when we open up the Quran, it's not saying a particular Muslim at a particular time was commanded to commit violence in some particular set of circumstances. The commands to commit violence are directed towards Muslims. They're directed towards Muslims. So the, 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 our, our bread and butter when we bring this topic up, Surah 9, verse 29, says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. And it gives a list of things you're going to fight people over. And it specifically says, from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, uh, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So this passage, it's not a command to a particular Muslim. It's not saying, and it was revealed to Moses that he had to go fight someone. It's a command, it's a command to Muslims. It is a command to Muslims to fight. And these are Muhammad's final marching orders. Surah 9 is the last major surah revealed in the Quran. And it commands Muslims to go out and fight. And you find a bunch of passages like this. You find them in the Quran, you find them in the Hadith, where Muslims are told they're supposed to go out and violently subjugate unbelievers. And it doesn't say, just you, just you, and then once you're done, and then once you die, then it's over. These are, these are the final marching orders for Muslims. They are told to go out and fight. And guess what? That's all you see for the first, century, for the first several centuries of Islam up until the modern period where Islam wasn't as powerful, and that's when you start hearing Islam's a religion of peace. Before this, no Muslim said Islam's a religion of peace, unless they mean it in a very specific sense. Uh, but Muslims are commanded to go out and violently subjugate other people. Are Christians commanded to go out and violently subjugate yeah. unbelievers? But we do have passages in the, in the Bible talking about fighting and killing yeah, and so on. True. So what do we do with those passages, uh, Sam? Now, even before I get into it, we don't have to take a break, do we? Because I don't want to get cut off in the middle. Okay, of the okay, yeah, we, yeah. we do, we let's do. Let's take after let's, the break. So let's we take can have let's time. take let's take our uh, let's take our last break. We'll come back. We'll answer this yeah. question, and then and then we'll we'll move on. Yeah. All right, all right. We'll see you back in just a moment on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We've got a question about the uh, violence in the Bible. Is it, is it the same thing? I pointed out that. Uh, the violence we find in the Quran is prescriptive. And all that means is it's actually te it's a prescribing behavior. It's telling Muslims, you go out and do this. The question is, is the violence in the Bible, and there is violence, there is violence yeah. in the Bible, is that telling Christians what to do? Is that telling us this is how you are supposed to go out and treat people now? Yeah. Obviously, in the Old Testament, that's not written for us. This exactly. is in the context of you know, yeah. wars over the land of Israel. Yeah, and so you can on. even read it says exterminate a specific people group and it mentions them by name, like mm -hmm. the Canaanites. Well, we don't have any Canaanites. And it's not go well, out and exterminate no, everyone no, for no. all time. And go blah, and blah, wipe blah, blah, out blah. everyone that breathes who doesn't believe in Yahweh or yeah. Moses as his messenger. Yeah, yeah. Does not exist yeah, in the Old Testament. Happen. So that's a description of how God worked through Israel at that time. But the argument goes like this, and this was the point. And I'll try to address it briefly. And Lord willing, I hope you're listening. We're going to devote a full topic uh, sometime this week. If not tomorrow, maybe Monday, Lord willing. Lord willing, mm -hmm. we'll devote in a full topic on addressing all the New Testament passages that Muslims wrench out of context to prove that that command to wipe out anyone who doesn't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ is still binding upon us. Yeah. But let me real quickly address, real quickly, you said Luke 14.23. Uh, Luke 14.23 says this. This is a passage that Muslims do quote out of context. Uh, Jesus is quoting a parable, and in the parable, the master said to the servant, Luke 14, 23, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. Uh, for some reason, Muslims assume compel means use violence, use force, even the threat of death, if they don't embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that can't be the meaning, that compel cannot mean use physical violence, physical force, to compel people to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is easily confirmed by looking at Luke chapter 10 verses 5 to 15 specifically Luke 10 verses 5 to 12 so brother I hope you're listening to me if you want to know what this passage does it mean just go a few chapters earlier to Luke chapter 10 verses 5 to 15 specifically 5 to 12 let me read it here's what Jesus tells his disciples to do when someone rejects the gospel if compel means kill them or use physical violence then surely you'll find it in the clear instructions that Jesus gives to the disciples as he sends them out to preach the gospel, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Luke 14, 23 is a parable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you take a parable, misinterpret it, 
in order to uh, give the impression that Jesus is saying use physical force. Well, here's plain instructions on how to spread the gospel. In Luke 10, verses 5 to 15, and notice what Jesus does not say. Let me read it. <clears throat> Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. <clears throat> if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you, is upon you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you. Now here's where we'd expect Jesus to say use physical violence, right? Mm -hmm. He says, whatever town you enter and they don't receive you, go into the streets and kill them, behead them, torture them. No. Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Did you catch it? That Jesus says, if a town rejects you, kill them, oppress them, beat them, take their women and children. No, he says, wipe the dust from your feet. Because on that day, it will be more bearable for Sodom than for them. What day does he have in mind? The day of judgment. In other words, my brother, we have no right to execute anyone who refuses the gospel because God has set a day in which he'll judge all who refuse to embrace the gospel, the day of the Lord Jesus when he comes in glory to judge the living and the dead. You can't get any more explicit, any more plain, any clearer than this that we have no right to physically compel people to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you find that over and over again. Uh, oh, yeah. In, 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 as far as specific, as far as Jesus' uh, specific commands about what his followers are to do, and in, in more general principles about how Christians are to think of other people, we're commanded to love everyone, right? In fact, let me confirm that this passage was carried out to the T by the apostle. Mm -hmm. Because Luke, wrote, Luke also wrote, wrote Acts. How did Paul and Barnabas respond to the Jewish rejection of the gospel? Acts 13.51 tells you. Notice what they did. And they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Uh, 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 Is that how you pronounce it? Iconium. Iconium. Iconium, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did they do? They carried out Jesus' instruction. Did they take a sword and kill the Jews and physically compel them? It says no. Mm -hmm. They wiped the dust from their feet and went to another town. Acts 13. Verse 51, I hope so, that answered your so, question. So here's, so here's what you have in Islam. You have the commands, fight those who do not believe in Allah. How did Muhammad's followers interpret and carry out this passage? Well, they show how they interpret it through their actions. They went out and fought and subjugate everyone in Arabia, yep. and then they right spread beyond them. their yep. borders, right? Yep. So you have the verse. If there's any doubt about what the verse means, you have the interpretation of his followers who interpreted it, who interpreted, fight those who do not believe, as fight those who do not believe they went out and fought. In the Bible, you have the exact opposite. You have Jesus commanding his followers to love everyone, to harm no one, to put down their swords. He said his kingdom is not of this world. That's why his followers aren't fighting for him. And how did his followers interpret all this? By going around killing? No, by going around. And the, the most extreme thing the Christians would do is shake their dust off their feet and walk Boy, to another town. Boy, that's very violent. Yeah. So you have, again... Quran, violence, it's commanded, and then Muslims interpreted it as violent command. So if you want to say it meant something else, you're telling me even Muhammad's followers didn't know how to understand it. And if you're telling me Jesus commanded violence, you're telling, you're telling me, wow, his followers just didn't get that message. He must have been a really poor communicator. So the, the, the passages are clear, but as Sam pointed out, either tomorrow or on Monday, we'll give a fuller discussion and any particular questions people might have, uh, call in with those if you're if you're interested in this issue. We'll discover we'll discuss this in more detail. Uh, but tonight our, our topic is who corrupted the gospel. Uh, we still have a couple more points to get to. Let's try and uh, take very quickly a couple of callers um, and then get and then sort of wrap this wrap this up because we only have about 20 minutes left. So next caller, who do we have? Jabari. Hello. Hey, what's uh, up? Hey, Jabari, what's up? Yeah, Good. I'm good. I'm glad to see you guys. Paul, I'm surprised. That I never expected to see you on ABN, so that's amazing. I'll take that as a compliment. That's no, right. no, 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 no. Well, yeah, does he mean you're too cool for us, or does he mean, no, wow, no, no, you're, no, such no. A, you're such a doofus, what are you doing sitting in between Sam I'm and Paul? Too cool for that's not what I, I wasn't saying the second one. I was saying the first one. Okay, I wasn't okay. saying the first one either. <laughs> I was saying I was surprised. Okay. Right. Oh. And I'm surprised okay. that you're surprised, but go ahead. No, I'm kidding. Go What's ahead. up, buddy? Yeah. 
Yes, I just wanted to add on some more verses from the Quran to confirm your point. Surah 546, Surah 550, and Surah 571. Yeah. Those are the ones I wanted to go go for. And I wanted to respond to the previous caller's point when he said that the talked about Old Testament violence. I wanted to add on verses to what you guys were saying. Deuteronomy 9, 5, and um, and um, Genesis and Genesis. Genesis 15, verses 13 to 16, and Leviticus 18, verses 24 to 30. Um, also, third, I just want to say that Muslims, you have a problem, and I pray that this will drive you guys to lead, will drive you to to receive the Lord Jesus. I pray that this, what you guys are saying, will drive them to, to receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. Mm-hmm. Good. I pray, I pray, I pray for you, I pray for you, David and Paul, I pray that you guys don't get arrested or anything like that in Dearborn, <laughs> and... And I'll be, and God, bless, and God bless all three of you. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me just comment on the versification. Mm-hmm. He's going by a Quran translation that goes with a different versification. Because mm-hmm. he said Surah 550. In most Qurans, that's 548. Mm-hmm. So when he says four, 546, in most Qurans, you'd have to look at a couple of verses earlier. This is why we said in chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. So that's what he's referring to. When he said chapter 5, verse 71, in most Qurans, it's chapter 5, verse 68. Mm-hmm. Because the versifications are different. Most Qurans will follow the standard versification, but there are some that follow a different uh, versification system. So 568, 548, and uh, 543 to uh, 47. Sorry. All right, brother, thank you. All right, bless uh, you. let's go to our next call, and then we have to get back to a couple points. Who do we have? Oh, okay, they're off the line. All right, all, all right, right. Let's all go. right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go back to, um, uh, let's go back to our topic. We've seen... Something very interesting. Muslims tell us that the gospel has been corrupted. According to the Quran, no one can corrupt Allah's word. And yet Muslims have to believe that the Bible has been corrupted. Otherwise, they just have to abandon Islam. So how are Muslims supposed to view this corruption of the Bible, given that the Quran constantly affirms the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, and that the Quran repeatedly declares no one can corrupt Allah's word? Well, we've said, we've said, uh, that according to the Quran, we, 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 we gave you the references. Jesus was a messenger, so you can't say, I don't care what Jesus says, or, or that his, the message was corrupted from the beginning because he, you know, he, he's not reliable. Muslims can't say that. Jesus is a messenger of God. Jesus was successful, at least somewhat, in his preaching in that he won followers. And Allah promises, he promises Jesus that he's going to protect Jesus' followers. Now, Sam, according to the Quran, did Allah keep that promise? Did he keep yes. that promise to make Jesus' followers of course. superior, victorious? Yep, and then you'll find that in chapter 61, verse 14. And before we're, we're, the show's over, remind me to read one passage of the Quran that will be ironic and shocking to not only uh, Christians but to Muslims. But in chapter 61, verse 14, uh, what David is asking me, does the Quran record the fulfillment of the promise? Remember earlier Paul alluded to chapter 3, verse 55, where Allah is supposedly speaking to Jesus. He says, I'm going to raise you to myself and make those who follow you superior to those who disbelieve till the day of resurrection. Now, does the Quran record the fulfillment of the promise? Yes. Chapter 61, verse 14. Let me read it. 61, verse 14 of the Quran says, O you who believe, be you helpers of Allah or God. <clears throat> As Jesus, the son of Mary, said to his disciples, who will be my helpers uh, to God? Said the disciples, the disciples said, we are God's helpers or the helpers of Allah. Then a portion of the children of Israel believed and a portion disbelieved. But we gave power to those who believed against their enemies and they became the ones that prevailed. Which ones became uppermost? Those who believed. The believers, they prevailed. so they won. Yes, according they to 6, so, 14. So some believed, according to this passage, right? So Jesus preaching, we talked about him being at least somewhat successful. Not everyone believed. But we know some of them believed and some didn't believe. According to Muslims, if they say the gospel has been corrupted, it's some kind of weird unbelievers or heretics Paul. who were victorious, right? right they were right. victorious, according to what Muslims are telling us. Exactly. But the Quran tells us that the true followers of Jesus we're victorious. So Allah promise, according to the Quran, Allah promises Jesus. We already read that. Allah promises Jesus. He's going to protect his followers and make them superior. And then we read Allah actually did keep that promise. Precisely. He made the true followers of Jesus victorious. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Sam, Paul, yeah. we look down to history. Yeah. 
the Christians who were victorious, in whatever sense you want to say, if you want to say, you know, politically or just through numbers or who preserved the scriptures or what, the Christians who actually became dominant down through the ages, what do they believe? Yeah, Paul, you tell us. What, 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 what do Christians believe? The most influential Christian that God has raised up. <laughs> what happened? What, what, whose influence spread and it continues to spread all over the world? Well, Muslims like to bring up a lot the Council of Nicaea and other things like that. So we see that throughout history, the past 2,000 years of Christianity, the message has been the same, which is what we started off talking about, the three points of the gospel. Exactly. Jesus' deity, uh, resurrection, and crucifixion. Those three points, the death. And not only that, but the man that God used more so than any other apostle is the apostle Paul, your namesake. Right. Now, you understand the implication what David's getting at. If Paul corrupted the gospel... And yet his message spread, that means the followers of Christ were vanquished and defeated. There goes Allah's promise. But since Allah said he did give them victory, that means they did succeed. But then that means if Paul's message is the one that triumphed and spread and continues to spread all over the world, that means the message of Paul must be the message of Christ and therefore the message of God. But Paul's message was Christ is the divine son of God, the agent of creation. The father used Jesus to create everything. Christ sustains everything by his powerful word. That's in Hebrews, but Paul also says Christ sustains everything. That he died on the cross for our sins to reconcile all creation to God, rose again and sits enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords, that he's the Lord of creation, and will return again physically, bodily, to judge the living and the dead. That is the message that spread. That is the message that triumphed. That is the message that continues to spread like wildfire all over the world. Therefore, if the Quran is true, this must be the true message. But if it's the true message, then the Quran must be false because it contradicts the message of those who triumphed. Well, dum -da -dum -dum. well now, now, what do, now what do we have? Now we, we, we only leave you Muslims with two options. It's not us leaving you with these two options. Uh, this is what your scriptures leave you with. According to, not according to us, not according to David Wood, Paul, uh, Sam, not according to us, according to your book, the book you believe in, the book delivered by your prophet. Jesus was a true messenger. He was successful. Some believed. Allah promises he's going to protect those true believers until the day of resurrection. Then Allah keeps his promise, makes them dominant. We can look down through history. Which Christian group became dominant? The ones who believe in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. They were the ones who were uppermost. They were the ones superior. They were the ones who won. If you want to say there were early Muslims. If you want to say there were early Muslim followers of Jesus, they were crushed so thoroughly we have no record of their existence. Exactly. You can't say they became uppermost. You can't say they were superior until the day of resurrection. They lost horribly so that we don't even have a shred of evidence of their existence. So if you want to say there were early Muslim followers of Jesus, you have to do that by blind faith. But not only do you have to have blind faith, you have to believe that the Quran is wrong when it affirms that God would protect the true followers of Jesus. So according to your Quran, Allah protects the true followers of Jesus. He keeps his promise, makes them victorious. And the Christians who are victorious historically are the ones who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. So this is the option we leave you with, my Muslim friends. You can either believe what we believe, because according to the Quran, what we believe is the message that Allah preserved and helped spread by empowering the true followers of Jesus. So if you believe those passages of the Quran, which you should as a Muslim, and because it's good theology, you might want to believe those. If you believe those passages of the Quran, you have to believe what we believe, that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, that he claimed to be divine, because that's the message Jesus delivered that was preserved by his followers, that was preserved by the power of Allah, protecting the true followers of Jesus. What is your alternative? What is your alternative here? That the gospel was corrupted. But now we get back to this, the, the key question, who corrupted it? According to the Quran, no one can corrupt Allah's word. The Apostle Paul cannot corrupt it. The Council of Nicaea cannot corrupt it. Christians can't corrupt it. Muslims can't corrupt it. Buddhists can't corrupt it. Atheists can't corrupt it. No one can corrupt it except the one who has power over all, all things. things. Allah. And guess what? That is exactly what your Quran teaches. According to the Quran, Jesus never, never, 
died by crucifixion. Wait a minute. I open up the gospel. I find Jesus died by crucifixion, but it never happened according to Islam. So where did Christian Christians got the false belief false? According to you, Muslims, Christians got the false belief that Jesus died by crucifixion. So that's been corrupted somehow. That's been corrupted. Contrary to what the Quran says, it's been corrupted. It didn't happen. And yet Christians believe it. Paul, where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died by crucifixion? Allah. Exactly. How did, how did Allah give us the idea that Jesus died by crucifixion? Took Jesus up and replaced him with someone else. Replaced him with someone else. So, my Muslim friends, if you want to say, we, we talked about these three core elements of the gospel. If we talk about Jesus' death and thereby belief in his resurrection, since that depends on his death, where did the false belief in Jesus' sacrificial death come from? You can't blame it on the Apostle Precisely. Paul because according to Islam, it didn't come from the Apostle Paul. You can't blame the Council of Nicaea because according to Islam, it didn't come from the Council of Nicaea. That false belief, not according to us, according to your Quran, came from Allah when he tricked and deceived people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion. And yeah. before the show is over, let me give you, I don't want to say the best for last, because mm -hmm. what you just said was much better, because you're presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the Quran is true, then the gospel found in the New Testament is the true message of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, the true message that originates from the true God, and therefore that message must be believed by everyone, especially Muslims, in order mm -hmm. to be saved. No, but, but, and the only alternative, if Muslims want to say they don't want to believe in that message, they don't want to believe in the gospel, the only alternative is to say, well, I can't believe in that because it's been corrupted, but we want oh, yes. the message we want to tell you is you if you want to say it's corrupted, fine. Don't say Paul corrupted it. Don't say the yes. Council of Nicaea corrupted it. Don't say Christians corrupted it. Say it like it is. Allah is the only one who could have corrupted it. And according yes. to the Quran, the only example we have of corruption, Allah is the one who corrupted it. Precisely. So here are your alter alternatives. Either believe the passages of the Quran which say that the true message of Jesus' followers was preserved by the power of Allah, in which case you need to believe in his death, deity, and resurrection, because that's the message that was preserved. Or the only alternative you have open to you is to believe that it's been corrupted by the power of Allah, who deceived people into believing a false message, who deceived people into believing in that. And since he's the one who corrupted the belief about Jesus' death and resurrection, you might as well say he's the only one who could, who could, and he is, according to the Quran, the only one who could corrupt the message. Well, he must have corrupt, corrupted belief in Jesus' deity and the Trinity and so on. He's the only example we he's find of someone it, yeah. corrupting the gospel. So he's the only one with the power to do it, and he's the only one in the Quran who actually does it. So he must have been the one who corrupted belief in Jesus' deity as well. So those are your alternatives, my Muslim friends. Then I'm going to hand it over to Sam for his passage. Finally, to Thank add you. irony of ironies, Throughout our entire discussion, we presented conclusive evidence from the Quran that nowhere does the Quran say our scriptures are corrupt. In fact, our, uh, our scriptures, according to the Quran, are the uncorrupt revelations of God that God has preserved providentially as a witness for Jews and Christians to judge by, even to judge the contents of the Quran. We also saw the Quran saying that the true followers of Christ were given victory, a victory that will be theirs till the day of resurrection. But finally, irony of ironies, the Quran does say there is a scripture that has been corrupted, but it's not the Bible. Oh, the Quran yeah. <laughs> says that the Quran has been corrupted. Did you hear what I just said? This is for Christians and Muslims. If you're asleep, this should wake you up. Chapter 15 of the Quran, Surah Al-Hijr, verses 90 to 91. The Quran testifies that at the time of Muhammad, there are people corrupting the Quran. Language used of the corruption of the Quran that's never used for the Bible. What am I talking about? Chapter 15, verses 90 to 91, here's what it says. Like as we sent down on the dividers, those who made the Quran into shreds. Those who made the Quran into shreds. Yusuf Ali says, this was, by the way, the uh, Shakir translation, or Shakir. Yusuf Ali say, says, so also on such as have made the Quran into shreds as they please. The Quran says there are people at the time of Muhammad who are shredding the Quran, tearing it up, right? Tampering with it as they please. Language never used the Bible. Now, David, could you imagine if the Quran used this language for the Bible? If the Quran said, those who tore the Bible into the shreds, Muslims would have a field day using that verse, beating us over the head. See, the Quran says your Bible's corrupt. 
But that language is used for the corruption of the Quran, and yet you still believe the Quran is preserved. So we have in the Quran constant affirmation of the inspiration, authority, reliability, and perfect preservation of the Christian scriptures, the yeah. Torah and the gospel, yeah. constantly praising us, constantly telling us to judge by them, telling Muhammad even, your prophet is commanded not to go to another prophet, to come to us. Your prophet was, Muhammad, if you're having doubts, go to those Jews and Christians over there who've got their book. Go to them. Your prophet is commanded to come check with us to, so we can check him off and say, okay, let, 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 let's go down the check. Let's go down the checklist and see if you agree with our message. Your prophet is commanded that. And then when we say, well, what, is the, what does the Quran say about itself? People have shredded it. They've <laughs> shredded that book. Yeah. And yet Muslims, think of the irony, Muslims tell us, Quran has been perfectly preserved, despite the fact that according to the Quran it's been shredded. And the Bible has been corrupted, despite the fact that the Quran says over and over again it's uh, authoritative, inspired, reliable, perfectly preserved. Yeah, irony of irony. What? And you, 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 you sit back, if you're not a Muslim, you're, sit back, you're sitting back wondering, how is this not obvious to them? How is this not crystal clear to Muslims? How do they not immediately notice, wow, our book self-destructs. It affirms the Christian scriptures and totally contradicts them. How do they not see this? Well, the answer is, if they saw it, they wouldn't be Muslims. Precisely. They wouldn't be Muslims. And I'll Lord tell you what, Christ. more than almost anything else, when I, look at, when I look at this, it clues me in that there is a spiritual battle going on here. Because people, can, people cannot be, they can't be this deluded on just on their own, right? I mean, people have, people, we're more intelligent than, than animals. We have a God-given ability to think and to think logically and to think critically when we want to. And you go and you have 1.5 billion people who can open a book that constantly affirms the scriptures of the Jewish Jews and Christians and then constantly contradicts the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. It should be immediately obvious to any Muslim, wait a minute, I have a problem here. I have a massive problem. I have an irreconcilable problem. My book self-destructs because it contradicts itself at a fundamental level and there's no way out of it if the if the scriptures of the jews and christians are reliable and authoritative and inspired the quran is false because it contradicts them if their books uh if their books are reliable if they aren't reliable either way islam turns out to be false muhammad turns out to be a false prophet it's a dilemma you only have two directions you can go you only have two possible directions and either one of them leads to the conclusion that islam is false that muhammad was a false prophet not according to us, according to your scriptures. And we've presented kind of a further dilemma tonight. You can either accept what we believe as Jews and Christians, or you can believe that Allah is a horrible deceiver who starts false religions for no reason whatsoever, just for the fun of deceiving people. And if you believe that, my Muslim friends, I don't know how you can even believe in Islam to begin with. Because you believe in a God who starts false religions just for kicks with no reason. <laughs> well, if he, starts false, if he started the false religion of the Christians, how do you know he didn't deceive you? Oh, but he, 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 he gave us this book. Wait, he gave us a book, and it was deceptive. Of course, he deceived people. He put, false, he put false doctrines in there. If you're going to believe, and why, and by the way, why? What is the only possible explanation for why Allah would deceive all these people? You have to say, well, maybe he just didn't like the Jews, and that's why he deceived all these people. Maybe he didn't like the, the, people, the, the, Christ, I mean, the people who would become Christians. Maybe he didn't like them. And that's why he gave them this false religion to believe in. If you're going to say that, why not say, well, maybe he didn't like the Arabs, and so he gave them a false religion too. That's what happens. When you introduce an all-powerful deceiver into the question, yeah. we have no way. We have no way. God could be tricking us all right now. You might not even be watching me right now. I might not even be real. If Allah tricks people into believing Jesus died by crucifixion when he didn't, how do you know he's not tricking you into thinking I'm here right now just to mess with your mind? You don't know what to believe if you have an all-powerful deceiver in the equation. And so believe our message, believe the gospel, or the alternative, turn off your intellect because you just can't get to the bottom of this because God could be deceiving you about anything. Those are your alternatives here. I know our time is up, but in fact, to just piggyback off what you just said, if Allah could corrupt the message of the gospel, and, and yet, if Allah does that for the gospel, which opens the door for the possibility that he did it for the Quran, on what grounds can any Muslim say for certainty that Murza Ghulam Ahmed is not a prophet after Muhammad, that he's not the Indian Messiah as he claimed, 
On what grounds can any Muslim say that Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church isn't a prophet that came after Muhammad, or that Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam, that these people were not true messengers and prophets sent by Allah, if Allah could corrupt the message of Jesus by sending a, another message through Muhammad that co contradicts the Bible. You can't say, well, because these religious uh, texts contradict the Quran. Because the, contradict, uh, the Quran contradicts the Bible, and you're telling me, well, the Bible's corrupt. Yeah. And yet God says, or Allah says in the Quran, that the message of Jesus triumphed, and that the message of Jesus would continue to triumph until the day of resurrection. So if we go that route, the route that you suggested, then that means Muslims have no grounds to argue that Murza Ghulam Ahmed or Baha'u'llah or, or Bab Allah or uh, Joseph Smith, that these people are false prophets just because they contradict the Quran. And they can't say that they're, you could never know that they're true prophets because you, have, you believe in a God who goes around deceiving people and starts false religions. Exactly. So that, my friends, if those are the options your book has left you with, either believe the, either believe the religion of other people and reject Islam, or believe that Allah is a horrible deceiver who starts false religions, in which case you can't really believe in Islam, if those <laughs> are the options oh, your brother. religion has left you with, how can you say this came from God, yeah. my friends? You have no basis for saying this yes, from God. Man. God is better than your book Hallelujah. teaches. God is better Hallelujah. than your religion Jesus teaches. Name. And we'll talk more. We'll talk more about the one true God uh, over the next few days as we continue our marathon. We'll be back. Uh, Sam will be back tomorrow. I'll be speaking somewhere, but Sam will be back Lord tomorrow. Lord, yes. Uh, we'll both be here on. Uh, we'll both be here on Friday. We'll continue this marathon. Be sure to keep tuning in. Uh, check the schedule because the times uh, the times differ here and there. But we'll see you tomorrow, right back here on Jesus or Muhammad. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, yes. Sam. Uh, we'll see you again uh, starting tomorrow. See you next time.